We started the company in 2017. Uh, it was called Recognize by then. And actually it was my co-founder, Francisco Aranda. He's the, the CTO. Uh, and also Amelie Vialet is leading the, the product. And we've been since the beginning, uh, since 2017, like focusing on NLP uh, applied to, to enterprise problems. So we've been doing like a lot of consultancy pilots and so on. We've been releasing some open source libraries since 2018. And we had this uh, data annotation tool that we used for projects. Uh, and actually it was kind of a part of the open source, but not really promoted as such. So as we've been involved in like uh, training uh, models in Spanish for Hugging Face, also for, for the first version of, of, of Spacey, we really believe in the power of open source and collaboration. So actually uh, a few months ago, we decided to actually rebuild the data annotation tool in a way that is much more uh, interoperable and, and that can play really well with the, with the NLP uh, and the open source uh, NLP stack. Hello everyone, welcome to another episode of the D4Data channel podcast. I'm your host Deepak and with me we have Daniel Villa Zero. Daniel is the CEO and co-founder of Agila. Previously he was working in R&D sector and currently into building Agila. In this podcast we'll be discussing a lot about data-centric NLP and uh, about this particular awesome package Agila. It's a pleasure to have you here today Daniel and uh, thank you for accepting my invitation. Thanks so much for inviting me. Deepak? Yes. yes. Great. So uh, I have a couple of questions and starting with this one. So uh, why we specifically refer to as data centric AI? So that's a, a good question. And I think there's not like a formal definition. I think it's a, a trend and a discipline that uh, tries to shift the focus from, from models and model experimentation and code. Uh, towards uh, data, uh, and I think the most important aspect of that is uh, related to, to to data curation, data labeling, data collection, and continuously uh, analyzing the quality of the data rather than like gathering huge data sets and just feeding the models with those huge data sets. So there are many different technologies that approach this, and I think we are in the phase of building uh, platforms and, and tools that can actually help uh, data scientists and, and data teams to to actually tackle uh, this this problem. Right, right. So uh, regarding the bias and fairness aspect or the ethical concerns rising with these kind of large models, so like how can we address the potential biases and ethical concerns that arises with these kind of uh, large models in terms of data which we use to train these kind of NLP and how we can mitigate all these uh, privacy violations and potential of misuse. Okay, so I, I, I think this is really, and it will become like a hot topic and an important topic in in, in AI in general and also in NLP. Uh, and I don't think I have an answer like globally because this is being discussed with uh, like different different uh, domain experts such as lawyers and, and government people even. So I don't have a clear answer on that. What I could say is that uh, the data-centric approach could help at least uh, data practitioners and enterprises to to actually analyze uh, the, the the training data and also the, the data that is being used for making predictions. Uh, and I think during this podcast we will discuss some of these approaches. But what I would say that the most important thing is like to be transparent about uh, the source of data, uh, apply. Uh, trying to apply in the enterprise uh, domain uh, techniques such as uh, de-identification, anonymization, and so on. Uh, but yeah, we will touch on this uh, later, like uh, because if you start using large language models, then the data generated, you really don't know where it comes from. And this is being discussed currently with models such as GPT-3 and, and others. True, true. So uh, what are some of the limitations of data centric approaches in NLP and like how can we kind of address them and like uh, so all these uh, data like such as the need for like large amount of label data or like the inability to handle like the out of uh, distribution examples so and so. Mm -hmm. So what are some so, of the limitations? 
So I think, yeah, as you said, the, I think the limitation is the the need of like high quality uh, label data. If, if we are talking about supervised uh, uh, machine learning, uh, and the, the problem with that is that is costly to to gather high quality data and and i think uh, many companies are starting to realize that uh, you need this high quality training data so this is uh, also like we need like a changing a little bit the the the, the decision making process about where it involves to apply ml in industry uh, that's the first thing and then for tackling like the need of large uh, uh, training sets and high quality training sets, I think are really promising uh, avenue is a uh, few shot, few shot learning, self-supervised learning and so on. And that together with active learning approaches and data selection methods can greatly help in at least bootstrapping projects and then creating uh, feedback loops so people can actually evolve this data. So I think few shot could be part of the answer to to actually uh, tackle this limitation that I think is a limitation of uh, ML in general, but it is true that for the data centric approach to be realized, we, we actually need processes to to actually create high quality training data. So I think FuShot can can actually break some of the initial barriers. Right, right. So uh, can you discuss some of the trade-off between using a large data set versus uh, using a more carefully curated data set for this data center can help you? So I would say yeah, that the, the trade-offs are if you are using like a large uh, noisy training set, uh, you might get a better generalization. That was the, like the initial hypothesis. And if you use like, like a more curated uh, training set, like uh, uh, labeled by domain experts and so on, you might uh, unintentionally introduce unintentionally introduce biases, and you will have probably a, like a like a less representative uh, training set. But on the other on the other hand, uh, by introducing like a large uh, training set, you are also introducing a lot of noise, and there are many studies showing that introducing noise into deep learning model into deep learning models actually causes uh, a lot of uh, issues uh, and can can actually uh, impact uh, both the quality of the of the model and and the and the accuracy so so i would say that uh, the other thing is that in order to have like a highly curated data set that could can become more complex in terms of like organization uh, aspects and processes because crowdsourcing a, a data set, for example, from, from Amazon Mechanical Turk can be really easy, but it can also introduce a lot of, a lot of issues. So I would say that uh, we need the tools and we need the, the infrastructure to actually uh, help companies and data teams to, to actually make the process of gathering these high quality training sets much more easier. And the answer to this uh, can can come from many different aspects, as I mentioned, few shot, active learning, programmatic labeling, and so on. But I don't think there's like a one size fits all formula for for this. Right, right. So I experienced this particular issue when uh, myself and my uh, colleague, actually, or my friend, so we were we both were actually working on this uh, fine tuning the uh, distributed algorithm for uh, environmental due diligence data set. And the problem with uh, this kind of uh, very custom domain data is like we will never get a uh, open data available for training these kind of things because it is very pinpoint towards like very uh, concise aspect in environmental domain. So for yes. that reason, whatever data which we try to augment or like use active learning, but, but like it was not really getting that essence actually. So what mm -hmm. finally we have to do is like we need to take some of the data from EPA website, Environmental Potential Agency. And from there, we actually had to ancurate. So my friend is an environmental scientist, so she, so they will be able to actually ancurate. But the process, as you said, it's extremely complex because yes. we have to manually sit and actually do that stuff. And even if you use an active learning on, so then we had to actually, and, and so what I did is I tried to increase the data set by uh, doing some active learning on top of it. But then still it's not actually like, even I could see, it's hardly some five percentage increase in efficiency or something like that. Even after scaling mm -hmm. to like maximum amount, so yeah. I could I could actually feel the importance of that curated data set. Yes, yes, and I think one important part is like 
after when you start using this model or at least using it internally and then maybe in production to to build these feedback loops when you have the model in production and then you are analyzing the predictions and you are gathering more data and then you can reuse some of these active learning techniques to actually uh, monitor and, and, and curate more data for for the next uh, iteration of the model so right right yeah true so uh, so how do data centric nlp techniques handle the problem of uh, concept drift so i think in nlp uh, like concept drift and data shift and data drift are all like all inter interrelated and sometimes it's difficult to differentiate one from another but what I, what I would say is that uh, the data centric approach, at least the way I see it, can help you uh, by continuously like monitoring data, monitoring training data, monitoring uh, prediction data or production data, and creating these these loops, as I mentioned before, can actually help you uh, a lot in identifying when your model is is degrading, a uh, bit of any any kind of drift or or model. Uh, or, or changes in the in the in the structure of the data. So there are many different things that you could do there. And when we are talking about, we will be talking also about uh, about bias and fairness and so on. So I think uh, this is also related uh, that that you actually need to look at the data uh, like more broadly. Like you need to 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 have like okay, my data is not only the training data, but it's also like the production data. So you, you look at data like globally, and then you try to focus on subpopulations of that data. Uh, and then you can analyze why the model is degrading or not uh, behaving as you expect in terms of bias or, or fairness. So I think like the data centric approach by uh, focusing on, on, on this data, on glo global, globally, this data can, can help you a lot in building this uh, these uh, more robust uh, systems uh, when it comes to to model degradation or, or drift. Right, right. So I also like what I felt is like like we cannot really uh, fully rely on the data element also because what really happens is uh, like which we observe. So like uh, in 2018 when we rolled out a model, we used uh, at the starting like we used Elmo embeddings. And after some time, like we got the distilled word embeddings and like, so we continuously and now like newer embeddings are there, which is having lower size of uh, like memory and stuff. So hmm. what really happened is like, we could see the performance improving, like when, when we are, whenever we are changing, because what really happens is the tokenization quality is improving, like basically hmm. because, because the problem is like, whenever we consider a word contamination. Contamination will never be in birds vocabulary or any other models vocabulary actually. And the yes. moment it actually cut contam, so it, it it actually check it out and the tokens which is actually coming out will not maybe representing that meaning. So mm -hmm. uh, so that's what, one thing which I observed because like when you said that uh, as you rightly pointed actually because it's not just about data. It's actually okay. <laughs> Model also plays a part there and it's actually tied up because Purely the word remains the same, but the way we are representing it actually shifts over the period of time. Shifts. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I think that there, there is a really interesting project. Uh, I don't know if you've seen this. Is this, uh, I don't know how, you, how they call it, like this online uh, training that they are doing, the Hugging Face uh, team, like retraining periodically Bert uh, and Roberta and, and GPT-2. So basically what they are doing is to actually retrain these models with uh, new data. So to include like things like COVID. And so right, I think right. they, a few days ago, they released a, like a really up-to-date model. And that's okay. really, I think, useful for, for people like to, to have, because all comes from, from words and, and from embeddings and there are new concepts that, that emerge. So using these uh, fresh, uh, fresh uh, models, uh, I think it's, it's right. also really important. But then the question is, how you actually can uh, build this like monitoring uh, thing because if you are changing the, the embeddings of the model then some of right. the things will change as well so i think this right. is really interesting but we really need to 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 move uh, forward towards these uh, online uh, online models i think Correct. because so, I, I yeah sorry yeah sorry sorry i interrupted sorry no i i i mean because even even ourselves uh, at the company we've been using like not now but before we were using like glove embeddings that they were trained i don't know like five yeah. years 
ago, so so probably yeah, it, it wasn't the best uh, the best the best vectors to to be used. So right, right, and I remember actually like when the COVID pandemic hit, so like people fine tuned that question answering model using COVID data, and then actually that so basically they started introducing the word COVID nineteen corona. so we just never there so over the period of time when actually words started impro- or like the context actually starts coming up i think people are be improving the algorithms actually absolutely so uh, how do data centric principles play a role in the design and implementation of data augmentation techniques so i think yeah we touched on this uh, and maybe i'm repeating the same the same thing but I think that data augmentation uh, has has been done like uh, kind of like okay I I have this data set of say like one hundred thousand examples and then I augment this and then I train my model uh, but the difference with the data centric approach is that as you include this new augmented data into this global vision of uh, global view of of the data you are going to apply the same uh, curation and the same selection methods that you will use for any other data so uh, right. and that w- will help you also detecting biases and and potentially uh, potentially critical critical examples that have been generated by by the documentation techniques so i think the 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 added value of of uh, this, this data centric approach could be to also have these curation mechanisms uh, when it comes to to augmented data right and also regarding the augmented data one more point to ask ask about is like so regarding when when we augment often like uh, there are chance that some ethical bias or something like that actually introduced because we are really generating more samples from it so like what 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 should be the right approach or like uh, what what can be done to kind of uh, have some some sort of control on these kind of issues yes i i don't have an answer like for the process of like data augmentation generation so how to control this i i, I don't know any any technique uh, i i wish I, i wish i knew but uh, when you generate data using i don't know back translation or or text generation or whatever uh, i think you need to analyze the the distribution of of this uh, augmented data and there's a package that i i found really interesting and it's called disaggregators is by nima boscarino from from hugging face and we are starting to to look at this we we released a tutorial uh, recently so my idea would be like okay even if i'm augmenting this data i will flag this data as augmented and then i will apply the the something like the disaggregator uh, technique which basically tries to Uh, identify sub populations of the data so basically uh-huh. like booleans where they tell you okay this is talking about uh, uh, people uh, uh, young people elder people this is talking about uh, the africa continent this is talking about asia and so on so actually what you will create is data set slices and within this augmented data set you can see like uh, the distribution and you can check this distribution against like the 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 data the training data that wasn't uh, augmented so i i think that's a really exciting uh, direction true 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 perfectly because uh, i like i i have a paper on bias and fairness so that's it's mainly on news news bias actually so uh, so we 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 definitely thought about it like how to kind of uh, subpopulate the data and everything but that, that at that time the approach which we took was like given a particular data or a text corpus we tried identifying the bias causing components in the words or phrases and mm. then applying a mask language model on top of that to reverse the bias so it's like okay. uh, using the same bias detection we will try to iterate and see whether a, a new word which is coming into place is less biased or not so obviously we had to uh, train a sequence of models like one classification then ner then mm-hmm. so it, it's mm-hmm. it's a pipeline thing actually so uh, that's that's what one work which we have done and we are released actually so i remember okay. when i actually mentioned that process i, I yeah. think i've seen this is is on github because i i was I, looking at there in github actually it is okay. called dbias dbias is a dbias ah yes yes okay yeah. I, i i look into that uh, so thanks dbias is one actually so ideally essentially what we happens is like 
it will give like given a news article it will actually show the amount of reduction in terms of bias so mm-hmm. that is so we 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 thought of applying and like we tried applying on to some other context like esg news and everything like uh, okay. basically because we shouldn't be getting biased news right like on esg domain and stuff but mm-hmm. but the problem is like if we go into domain so generic news it's fine to apply because uh, news is actually like a very what is a bias is itself it's a subjective perspective because yes. bias in my mind will not be a bias in your mind and exactly. exaggeration in my mind may not be exaggeration for some other people so that mm-hmm. is the trickiest part so that's where like we tried focusing on media data because media data there will be a format always so this models are trained on media bias data which is a standard mm-hmm. actually on media mm-hmm. uh, info- news information so media bias it's like there is a set of standards that news reporters or media professionals has to oblige like okay we cannot use so and so things so that's the only standard which we could actually at least uh, at the name say okay we could actually treat but it's mm-hmm. the context is actually huge and yeah it's a big topic <laughs> very interesting so yeah so uh, moving on to my next question actually so like uh, how do we ensure the quality of labels obtained through crowdsourcing and how how do you handle disagreements on errors in the labeling process okay so yeah first of all i i think we 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 are going to see a shift uh, in terms of like uh, crowdsourcing data sets and uh, labeling in in house so my 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 hypothesis is that uh, more and more like data labeling or human feedback will be done in house rather than like uh, like uh, using crowd crowdsourcing uh, systems uh, but answering your question i think there are many different layers to to approach uh, this and the first one i think is training and annotation guidelines and like properly train and give the enough enough information to 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 annotators and this is not something that happens okay you write the annotation guideline and and then you forget about it but it's something you iterate on uh, so yeah for for any data labeling project you will do different stages and you will iterate a little bit on on even on the labeling scheme and and how you define the problem and so on so that's the first thing like properly training properly explaining and iterating on the on the definition of the of the labeling task and the and the ml problem the other aspect is quality control. So I know that many people is not using like two annotators per example. I, we know many companies just having one label per example, which I understand because something sometimes the the data the the budget for tra- for labeling data is uh, is uh, limited. But actually, we would, we would recommend to to have like more annotators per example, and then there you can start applying like. Uh, inter annotator agreement and then you can uh, identify also disagreements and and actually do like a kind of um like a reviewing uh, process where you actually just focus on reviewing disagreements and and inconsistencies and so on so there are many different things you you can do another thing <clears throat> you can do is to gather like a really high quality gold standard so some uh, part of the data that is really uh, labeled by domain experts and so on, and use this as a control uh, data set to actually measure like the quality of the crowd workers. So actually, they will be labeling this gold standard, and you can see if they are basically like uh, making a lot of a lot of labeling mistakes. You can actually uh, rate this uh, the, the annotation quality of these uh, annotators. But as I said. I think what we will see more and more, and this is uh, also related to ChatGPT, GPT-3, and so on, is this uh, uh, human feedback uh, infrastructure that actually will, in my opinion, at least for the enterprise uh, space, will come uh, from trained uh, and skilled professionals rather than like uh, crowd crowdsourcing platforms. Right, right. Got it. Got it. So, uh, so over to the a platform agila and uh, so could you actually talk a bit more about your team and the work at the company yes so we we started the company in 2017 uh, at, it was called uh, recognize by then and actually it was my co-founder francisco aranda he's the the cto uh, and also i'm olivia let's is leading the the product and we've been since the beginning uh, since 2017 like 
focusing on NLP uh, applied to, to enterprise problems. So we've been doing like a lot of consultancy pilots and so on. We've been releasing some open source libraries since 2018. And we had this uh, data notation tool that we used for projects. Uh, and actually it was kind of a part of the open source, but not really promoted as such. So as we've been involved in like uh, training uh, models in Spanish for Hugging Face, also for, for the first version of, of, of Spacey, we really believe in the power of open source and collaboration. So actually uh, a few months ago, we decided to actually rebuild the data notation tool in a way that is much more uh, interoperable and, and that can play really well with the, with the NLP uh, and the open source uh, NLP stack. So basically, yeah, we started in 2017 and now we have become like a product company exclusively focusing on, on this uh, open source platform. Okay, okay. So my next question, obviously, it is like, so why it was decided to make it open source actually for the first time? I think it, for us, it, it was really natural in a sense because we were already collaborating in this space and we actually believe in in yeah in collaboration and actually talking to users and making what we build available to to everyone uh, but also it is true that it's also kind of like a business model and and in terms of business model is really interesting because you get like immediate feedback you you get to know how people is using your product and so on so i'm not gonna lie that this is also like a, a business uh, position to, to actually make it open source uh, widely available because in terms of like uh, uh, iterative development and improvement of the of the product is uh, is really great and also yeah it's kind of in the DNA of the team to to actually collaborate uh, across the open source uh, space and and to get to know people from uh, from everywhere in the world to to actually build uh, NLP NLP solutions. All right. That's great. And uh, so uh, nowadays, explainability is actually a very big thing, which which everyone needs, like even not just ML professionals, even the business, which they want to explain the stuff very mm -hmm. transparent. And, and these kind of models are really black box and like it's very hard to interpret. So like how well Aguila is actually serving in terms of model explainability? I would love to say that we are serving like a lot in this uh, in this space uh, but we actually took like little steps and small steps uh, and we will be taking more so for now uh, what we have and the way that Aguila is designed is to to actually empower uh, non 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 programmers uh, to actually analyze data have a, like a, a search interface where they can analyze predictions uh, and label data as well so in that sense it's already is not explaining the black box, but is at least giving the power to these users to to actually see what's going on with the with the models uh, in terms of like, okay, I, I can see this text and these are the predictions and this was the original label. So they have full power to actually go into the into the into the data sets. That's one thing. And the small step we are taking is to actually uh, let data teams to use uh, interpretation methods such as like uh, uh, integrated gradients, uh, SHAP, and things like that to actually introduce this uh, information, this interpretation into uh, Argila datasets and let uh, non-programmer users uh, to actually see uh, the interpretations. And actually, as we, as everything uh, is inside like a search engine, you can actually aggregate by this uh, by these values, so you can uh, more or less detect uh, patterns. But we, we are not an uh, ex explainability tool per se, but we will be actually moving towards the direction of letting uh, data teams to use interpretation methods, uh, put this information into Argila, and be able to actually monitor this with the help of uh, domain experts. Right, right. So, uh, so regarding the integration component like i i really appreciate like when i went to through the github i could see like it, it's seamlessly like it can integrate and functionalize every other components actually very easily and the newer libraries newer models mm -hmm. so uh so this is my last question as well so how do how do you envision the company adapting to the rapidly changing landscape in the ai industry 
So as you said, we we try to keep up with innovations in the field, uh, the design of the of the platform since the very beginning, because we actually rebuilt it from from scratch uh, a few months ago, is to actually be really easy to use with the with the, with the Python stack and with APIs such as uh, OpenAI and Cohere and so on. So basically, what we will try to do is to to actually uh, make this even easier for for companies to actually use different uh, new techniques uh, and and with this focus on that the important part uh, we are talking a lot about data centric but i i think another important aspect is this human in the loop or or human centered approach to building uh, nlp solutions so actually we would love to to give data teams the tools and the abilities to actually use uh, state-of-the-art uh, libraries, state-of-the-art uh, uh, methods, but with uh, centralizing this into like a human-centric or human-centered uh, uh, platform. So, so basically, data teams can be free to use many different approaches, and humans or domain experts can actually help building better, better NLP solutions. So we will be looking into like uh, large language models, uh, instruction uh, uh, based uh, based uh, language models, and so on. So that's the the main direction we are going to take. And uh, many people is asking us to do like multimodal as well, like uh, moving into images, uh, speech, and so on. But I think it's not the right time for us. We we really think that there there are many things to do in the in the NLP space uh, already, and we actually want to to realize this vision of of having like a uh, a platform that can be used by by domain experts and and data teams. Right, right, yeah. So that covers all my questions, Daniel. And thank you so much for sharing uh, your thoughts regarding this particularly important topic. And I I really learned a lot actually from this discussion. And thank you, thank you so much. And me too. Wish you good luck. Me too. This. It was it was great talking to you.